This is Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out. Delighted to be joined by a former good pro, Masters champion, and now <laughs> uh, top trainer, Alex Matvienko. Alex, how are you, mate? Yeah, very good, thank you, Danny. Yeah, very good. Now, yeah. For people that don't know, you were in the corner with Tommy Fury um, on Sunday night for his win over Jake Paul. Massive event, as it turned out. I actually really enjoyed it. I wasn't sure if I was even going to buy it the day before, but I did. BT will be glad to know if they're watching this. I'm sure I'm sure not everyone that watched it actually paid for it, um, but I did. Um, and yeah, really, really enjoyed it. I guess, first of all, w when did you first start working with Tommy? Um, I think l late last year, Tommy was meant to fight a guy called Paul Bamba. Mm. So John got in touch because we've got quite a busy gym in Bolton and um, they were after Southpaws. So I've got Kyle Lamorty in the gym, um, a good middleweight. I've got Marcus Tomlinson, a good middleweight. I've got uh, Kev Maziraka, a big heavyweight, Eli, a big heavyweight. And I also have a lot of gyms that travel to us because we're ki kind of central. So um, we get we get, we get get a lot of gyms coming with southpaws and all sorts of different weights and sizes. So um, last year before the Bamba fight, John come down, done some sparring with a lot of our lads, got got to know him a bit and uh, he, he, he liked the gym. And then um, one day we were just sat there and he says... Uh, do you fancy coming to Dubai? So I was like, you know what? I've never been to Dubai and I wanted to see Mayweather in the flesh and I thought, I'm quite busy because, you know, we've got a lot of fighters, but I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go. So I went and uh, that that's pretty much then from from just before the Bamba. Uh, well, that, that ended up getting cancelled. It was quite luckily that I got there really because uh, he ended up getting an exhibition with a lad who, who I know who trained at my gym, Rolly Lambert. Was, so. Yeah. Yeah, had I not been there, he might not have even boxed. So yeah, <laughs> All right, okay. Yeah, that's so, good yeah. stuff. Um, how do you kind of split how you work with Tommy with his dad John? So who who kind of does what? Sorry, one second, mate. Um, right. Well, obviously we come back from the exhibition. Tommy had a couple of weeks off, and then Tommy, Tommy was, um, you know, he he didn't really have a gym. I I think they was driving up to Tyson's, which is quite a long way, um, and they were coming past Bolton if they go into Tyson's, and then they was going to another gym down near their way. But Tommy would get mobbed by um, teenagers and kids and stuff, from what I gather. So I don't think they really had a proper base. So when we got back, and we spoke about it briefly while we were there, and when we got back, John said, "Get Tommy in the gym." So when when we got back, Tommy had a little rest, then um, got him back in the gym training with Roman for about six weeks. Mm. So I managed to do some, you know, to keep him sweating, do some drill work, um, you know, just going through some stuff with him. And I had a feeling maybe this fight had come along. So I just did a few drills against like, you know, moving away from the right hand, avoiding it, you know, working his jab better. Just, just little things. And then, uh, so I was sort of doing more hands-on. And then as the fight got announced, Obviously, John's come into the camp then and said, right, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. So uh, I sort of took half a step back from doing more of the technical work, um, started implementing the, the sparring partners, um, so bringing people from all over the place, organising all the sparring. Some days, John would say, get the body belt on. So I get the body belt on, throwing shots at Tommy. A uh, bit like, you know, how Bill, Billy Graham used to do it with Ricky. Um uh, and then Bob Howard would get the focus mitts on, so we'd split it like that. So there's Bob Howard as well, who was um, he boxed for the Lancaster boys, and he's always been around eyes at low, and uh, he, he's got Reese McMillan, a good aggressive uh, kid, uh, Callum Pearson, Russ, Russ Enshaw, who fought a Corley. So, he, you know, he, I think he's always had a good relationship with uh, the Furies. So he's done bits with Tommy in the past, but now Bob's been brought on board. So we, we sort of split it like that. And then John was doing more of the technical stuff, telling him what he needs to be doing in the fight and stuff like that. But, you know, we we all had a little say as well. So we, we worked pretty well as a team. And a lot of the perception of John Fury from people outside the sport is, you know, this aggressive man, turn on a sixpence, all that sort of stuff. But you've worked with him in the gym, preparing for a fight. What What's that dynamic like? Um, do you know what? He's, he's quite... Um, he is quite a nice guy. He's not like this, this um, sort of way that he gets uh, portrayed. You know, he's quite a 
well, I'm trying to think of the word. You know, a bit like a gentle giant in a way. Do you yeah. know, like um, he, he's not like just all aggression and, and stuff. How you presume? Yeah, he, he's a nice guy. He's he's well mannered. He comes in the gym. He sits down. You know, and sometimes he'll get up and say, "Does anyone want a brew?" And he'll make a brew for you. And, you know, he, he's a nice guy, and I like having him in the gym because some of the lads look up to him. So I've got some big heavyweights who are pretty good, just novices, but they're good amateurs, you know, and uh, John will say to him, well done today, you know, you did really well and you've got something about you and you can see it goes far. So um, he's he's quite motivating for the guys as well. And yeah, he's quite good to have around. Yeah, he's quite a character as well. So okay, yeah, he's, he's been a bit different. What did you make of Tommy when you first started working with him? Like what sort of level did you think he was? To be honest, when I first because of what I hear in the media, I don't really. I only watch the old fights. Like I seen Buddy McGurk while we was over there, and I was like, <laughs> I was watching your fight with Frankie Warren, you know, just last week, and I watched you with Simon Brack, you know, just chat, you know, like I like watching the old fights, and I watch the new stuff if someone's fighting someone. So um, I hadn't really watched Tommy. I'd only heard and read. So when he came into the gym, I was quite surprised how he handled the southpaws quite quite well. And I was surprised how fit he was. Uh, and then for this camp, he has been sparring really well. He's been sparring really well, you know, with some good good fighters. And uh, so, yeah, I was quite um, took aback a, a little bit. I thought, you know, he's better than what people say. Now, every sparring partner that's been in the gym says the same. You know, they do say the same, yeah. So I was quite impressed, really, to be honest, yeah. And you said when you first started working with him, you or after the the fight out in Dubai, you had kind of an idea that the Jake Paul fight was coming. What did you make of Jake Paul? Like, what was your impression of him before the fight was signed? Um, I think he's quite he comes across quite rude and quite. Um, you know, when you meet people in boxing, majority of people are nice, humble men respectful and that's what boxing teaches and you you get your few that slip through the net who who don't who ain't very respectful and so on but the majority of fighters that you meet are very respectful people and it comes across brash and arrogant and stuff like that but I feel like a lot of it's for the camera you know so really when he's off the camera he, he's he, you know he's sort of playing playing someone you know he's acting um, so when I first met him and saw him when we was in Dubai I was actually in Rowley's corner and there was obviously in that corner and then after the fight you know it, it, John's kicked up the media and you know got him and, and called him you know called his bluff you know and, and, I, and I was watching him and I was just thinking you know he's just um, I, I'm just not I, I'm not keen on them fighters who act the way that Jake does and I think it's it's, it's a poor role, role model um, so yeah, he he wasn't. I wasn't really a big fan of his, to be honest. Um, what about from a, a boxing perspective? Like, did you did you take him seriously? Boxing, yeah, I I always I always you, you've got to take everyone. You never underestimate someone. I mean, it's quite hard to dance with someone who can't dance, you know. So that that was one thing that I sort of worried about. But because uh, he, he is quite crude. He's quite a crude fighter, so sometimes them fighters don't really make you look good. If you look like uh, what's um, the middleweight called now, who's on the road, who fights every week? Sergey Am Ambo for um, Ambomo, yeah, Ambomo. He's quite crude, you know. He's quite comes in low, swings over, you know. He's quite he's small, fidget, you know. And it, it's hard sometimes to for fighters to look good against him. And uh, I felt like that was the way with Jake, you know. He's not very. He's not very. Um, what's the word? He, he doesn't flaw. He's, he, he, you know, he's quite crude. You know, it's hard to look good against someone like that sometimes. As you say, it's hard to dance with someone who can't dance. So, uh, yeah, I, I watched him. I felt like he was quite crude. I felt like he he repeated the same move. Like he'll look for a shot and then he'll look for it again and again. You know, straight after. So I felt like he had quite a lot of flaws in his makeup. Um, so I felt I, I didn't underestimate him, but I wasn't. I didn't feel like he was um, this massive superstar who was walking through professional fighters and and beating them all hands down. I wasn't believing into the hype as much as that. But you had to give him some credit, you know that you know he he, he was working at. He, he's a he's a workhorse. And because he's not a traditional type of boxer, like you said, he's quite crude, maybe unpredictable in some ways as well. How did you go about finding the right sparring for Tommy? 
Um, quite, I'm quite lucky. Like I've got a really busy gym, so I'm quite lucky with sparring partners. And um, there's a lot of people. The northwest of boxing is is a really busy, prominent part of the sport. You know, we we have so many, so many gyms. It, it's quite, it's quite a hotbed of boxing. Um, and there's a lot of talent, and there's a lot of talent that you'll never see because they can't sell tickets because they end up getting in trouble with the police because they just give up, um, you know, family, work. So we're quite lucky within our area, the Northwest. We get people travelling from all over the country to the Northwest for, for regular sparring. As well as that, I think once word gets out that Tommy's looking for sparring, people want to test themselves and see how re really good he is. So it's crazy the amount of people that will text you and say, if Tommy needs any sparring, you know, and, and you see these pros come down and then once they get in there, it's funny to see how different they are after, you know, because mm -hmm. Tommy's quite unorthodox. He's got long arms for a start. He's, he's, his arms are like uh, down to his kneecaps. He mm -hmm. walks on his hands and trips up half of the time. You know, he's got long hands. Uh, who gave you kind of the most beneficial sparring throughout the camp? Um, well, you know what? I wanted to change sparring up slightly. So... You know, we started off with um, an MMA lad and white collar kid who, who's who's had quite a lot of fights on the white collar. He's pretty good. Um, then once we did one or two spars with them, once the spar, you know, the first spar, we're just getting his feet in. The second spar, you could see his improvement straight away. So we took them out of the equation. We brought down Adam Heppel from Newcastle, who was a good spar. Um, two and all kid from Newcastle, come forward strong, looking for the right hand. We had some a couple of good rounds rounds with him for a, for a week. I think we did two spars with him. Then uh, I think then we brought in an ex, one of my ex pros, Stevie Taylor, big mm. strong lad who used to spar Matty Askin, Bellu, Jack Massey. You know, and he can still fight. Um, and he's fifteen stone. He's not killing himself. Get down to a weight. So we brought Stevie in, which was a good spar. And I think we had. Um, Another lad sharing the rounds. Who was that at that point? I think we had. Um, I think I brought Ben Ridings in for the inside work for like the. Uh, Ben's quite experienced on the back foot. Can make you miss him. Ties up well, and you know he he works with the hand that's free, as you saw Jade doing a lot. So I wanted to bring Ben Ridings in for the inside work, um, and then we brought. Uh, towards we're getting towards the end of camp. We brought Leon Willings in, who's a bit of a strong puncher. Um, a scouse lad who's, who's pretty respected. He's got a good right hand. So we brought him in uh, from Terry Spencer's stable. And uh, I don't want to miss it. Oh, Caffel Crawley, from, who trains with Pascal Collins. Mm. He comes forward, can take shots right, you know, and, and he'll keep, you know, putting pressure on. So I brought him in as well for um, staying in front of him. So, yeah, um, I felt like... We had a good mix of, you know, big, strong lads like Stevie, lighter kids like Ben Ridings, kids who can tie up. And, and they were fresh as well, so one, one in, one out. So they, they were fresh doing eight rounds. So, yeah, he had a good mixed bag of sparring. And we'll talk about the fight itself in a minute, but the actual occasion, the, the spectacle, go out to Saudi. Obviously, you had a, a long career yourself, maybe retired too early. You'll have to let me know, but... What did you make of the occasion and the spectacle side of it? How big an occasion was it? Well, I've been quite lucky to work with Oliver and, you know, I've worked um, corners of Felix Sturm, the Sergio Martinez, the Golovkin. I've been with some pretty big world stages and I, I'm forever grateful. And, this is uh, where Martin Murray fought them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, we've done some British title fights as well with Rocky and stuff. But, I mean, I've never been on anything I don't think many people can say they have. Maybe you're looking at like Muhammad Ali and, and, and uh, Joe Frazier sort of fights for the showbiz, the spectacular, you know, that it's bringing all these celebrities. Because you had Ronaldo there and, you know, Mike Tyson and, you know, you had all these celebrities there and the occasion was brilliant, you know. For a young 23-year-old who's not been very active, you know, in his career. And, you know, it, it was a lot to take on his shoulders. And these days with social media, everyone's a keyboard warrior. Everyone everyone had to knock Jake Paul out and, and so on. He had a big, big uh, weight on his shoulders. But because it, it was some phenomenal, it was crazy. You know, it was crazy. I mean, the, the press conference was funny because when he pulls out this, um, 
this lawyer's uh, oh you know, yeah the contract thing. You know, take a winner takes or what whatever it was you know you know and, and and it would just like it would crazy this the amount of things that were going on and you know the celebrities there and the attention it was getting the, yeah it, 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 it it's really changed boxing hasn't it it's made a quite a dynamic turn uh, which some people will say you get your old diehard fans who are saying nah you know what it's not for me and then you've got your new your your, your other fans or fans like I, I'm a boxing fan I, I, I can talk history of boxing I can talk, talk talk anyone to sleep about it but you know for me it's helped develop boxing in a way you know it's not like everyone else has been forgot about and pushed off they're still here it's just opened another sort of avenue for boxing and what said- YouTube boxing. You said about the pressure on Tommy's shoulders. Do you think, I mean, you saw him throughout fight week. Do you think that got to him a bit? It seemed to be a bit of nervous energy, at least at the start of the fight. Um, yeah, no, nah, he never showed it. I think I think he kept a very cool, calm shoulders, uh, head on his shoulders. I think John does a good job of keeping him confident, keeping him uh, calm. And, uh, Nah, I, th- I think if anything, I think he just couldn't wait to get in there with him. I think it's, it had been a long, long wait, and it two, three years. I think he really wanted to get this put to bed now, and I think maybe it made him start a bit, you know, uh, tight and tight. But he just wanted to get in. I mean, I'd have to watch the fight back. But no, nah, I, th- I think in in the fight week he was all right. He was very chilled. He was whenever he was breaking a sweat and having a workout. He, he looked good. He what he'd made weight really well, so he wasn't moody. Uh, didn't come across like he was nervous and moody. He he seemed fine. Yeah, he seemed really good. And during the fight itself, did anything about Jake Paul and his performance surprise you? Um, I thought I felt like he was great. Um, I'd like to see Tommy catch him a little cleaner on some of the shots. Some you know because he's he, he's he's awkward and quite crude, so he's leaning down and. Tommy's looking for the right hand and it's just missing sometimes. But then Tommy caught him with a lovely uppercut about in the fourth round mm. or as, as he fell in and he hit him with the uppercut. And I thought, he took that really well, you know, because I've seen people inspiring and, you know, they they get it on the chin in the 16s and, and, the, and the shook. Um, and obviously, you know, we look after everyone inspiring. The sparrow gets stopped, you know, and, and stuff like that. But he took the shot with the 10s on really well. And uh, got to give him credit, you know, he, he took the shot better than I thought. I thought he'd have folded. Um, so yeah, yeah, I was quite, I was quite surprised that you know he was pretty tough and durable. What did you make of the referee's performance? Very entertaining fight, but he's coming for a bit of criticism. Uh, you know, he, I think the occasion got to him a little bit, even though he's a. Uh, I think he's an experienced referee, if, I, if I'm correct. He is, yeah. I think I think he had he had a lot of pressure on him. You know, it was a massive event. Um, it was it, it, it was beautiful stadium. You know, the, you could see they put a lot of money into it. I mean, they just built it within a week, and it, it was just crazy. The lights, the the lasers, the screens. It, it was just un- it was an unbelievable experience. And um, I I just think there was a bit too much pressure on him. And obviously, was it because um, he didn't give a warning? And then he'd give him a straight point deduction. Is that how you're thinking? Yeah, Is that, that what... plus then he took the point off Tommy or like the next yeah. round to kind of even it up as well. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I mean, I haven't spoken to no one about this, to be honest, but exactly that. And, and I think I had a brief chat with Bob Howard and I think I just felt like what happened was, obviously, the fight was getting a little messy, clash of styles, both of them wanted to beat each other up. You know, they were falling in a little bit. And then uh, he obviously took that point off Jake. And then I think he's thought, I didn't take a warning. I didn't give him a warning. Yeah. So then I think he, he felt like he had to equal it out by then taking the point off uh, Tommy. Uh, even though I think he wanted to be stern and say, you know, I'm, I'm the boss in here. I'm, I'm taking control. But then he's just, obviously, I think it just might have got to him. But very good ref. You're a nice guy as well. He is a nice guy, that referee. So, yeah. And you, um, Tommy seems to be winning the fight comfortably. Like I say, it's competitive, but he seems to be winning most of the rounds. And then he got dropped in the last round. Um, were you surprised? Was there any worry that he'd tighten things up on the scorecards? Um, I mean, you're always worried when you're the B-side. You know, you're always a bit worried. Well, he, I'd say more than a bit. Uh, when I watched the shot, 
I actually saw his foot and I saw his, his slip on his front lead foot. I'd have to watch it again, but I actually, it looks perfectly like a slip to me. Even though a punch landed so correctly, he deserves a count. Mm. Uh, so I knew he wasn't hurt. So I, and I think it was quite early in the round. I think it was only one minute in. So I knew he would be all right for the next two minutes, obviously, as, as long as he avoided any silly crude shots, which is hard when you're fighting a guy like that. Uh, so I was all right with that. I was obviously worried about the scorecards. I was worried as soon as I found out there was an American judge a couple of days before, um, you know, because I thought it would be obviously more fairer to have an English judge or not have an American judge, even things. I think he even scored it for um, Jake, did he, the American judge? I think it was the American one, yeah. Yeah, I think, it, I think it was the American one who scored it. So, you know... Um, so obviously that was always in the back of my mind. I was always slightly worried. I felt like Tommy boxed well behind the jab, used his distance, making Tommy uh, Jake fall short at times. Obviously, you've got two novices in there. You're not going to expect, uh, you know, you know, an all-time great fight. But what what a good fight it was, though. You know, it weren't a great technical fight, but it it had the it had the ingredients of of a cracking fight. You know, you had two unbeaten guys going in there with a bit of bad blood. And, you know, they both put on a good show. And if you were worried when uh, he took that knockdown, how worried were you when the first scorecard got read out in Jake Paul's favour? Yeah, I'm thinking, because to me, it all seemed like there was a business plan. To me, it was like, Jake's Jake's going to come through, fight for a world title and, uh, you know, win a world title. Then the next minute, they've brought this belt in. This puts you in the world rankings. So I'm like... You know, why, why does he want to be in the world ranking so quick? This guy, this YouTuber, and they've made this belt. This were like Jake's belt, you know what I mean? You know, they weren't saying the winner of this fight wins this belt, they were like, We've made a belt especially for Jake Paul, and this, you know, this is going to put the winner in the world rankings. And I'm like, The winner in the world rankings, and I'm thinking, Badu Jack's part of that team, you know, Badu Jack's fighting Maccaboo. Um. Uh, and obviously, if he wins, is the winner? Uh, they're thinking Jake wins. He fights Badu Jack, make the fight that easy. Yeah, wins the world title, maybe. You know, <laughs> so I'm thinking this is all planned out. You know, this is all planned out. So that was making me very skeptical of us not getting it because there was a lot of money riding on this. I, I heard maybe Jake's got a contract for X amount of fights out there, or with the promotion, I'm not sure because I, I don't go into that detail. So, I, yeah, I, I was worried that, you know, I've seen it happen a million times. I saw it with Martinez and Martin Murray where I felt like we won the fight and you stood there and you're just thinking, you know, you, it happens in boxing. It's the unfortunate side, but the first card come out, I thought, oh, that's it. You know, they might rob us here, but then luckily, yeah, it, it, it went to plan. Yeah, so he did get the decision and now kind of the, the world's his oyster if it wasn't already. Um, yeah. what would you like to see him do now? Because the argument, obviously, we've seen from everyone is why would you drop down to central area level? And I know you work with Mickey Ellison, don't you? His central area champion at his weight or, yeah. or English title level or whatever for the amount of money you'd get for that compared to what he could get beating YouTubers in what would be easier fights. What what makes sense? You yeah. know, what really does make sense? Um I used to fight 10 rounds and get about two grand, you know. And and don't get me wrong, I loved it. So I'm I'm a I'm a diehard boxing person, you know. I I'd I used to fight for two grand, ten rounds, and I I never even complained. It wasn't about the money. Uh it was just about, you know, winning a small old title or anything, just fighting and just 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 being involved, just loving the game. Um and, and the game's changed that massively. You know, it's massive. We've had a bit of a split and it, it's just evolved. That's what's happened. So now when I look at it, and I've had this chat with Tommy, and uh, Tommy Tommy was saying like, uh, uh, you know, I would like the, the central area, go the domestic route. But now with everything that's going on, and with this money getting presented in front of him and earning that much money there, you know, does it even make sense? You know, it's like, it's like going backwards in a way for him, you know, to fight for them the central area and everything else. And which is, you know, I love the sport. I train a million I, I train fighters to for these titles. But then if they had the opportunity to go out and earn a million pounds, you know, and fight a YouTuber, I, I probably wouldn't say no. I'd probably say, go and take your million pounds, you know. 
it it pays the bills, the cost of living has gone stupid, you know, and everything else. And, you know, pe people worry about money and, you know, you need money these days, more than ever these days with, with the cost of living. And I just think my, my, my attitude's changed over the last probably six months of being involved with it. And, uh, the, the the amount of money is crazy to turn it down, really. And, you know, Tommy's probably thought the best YouTuber out of them all, the king of them all, because I don't think... Uh, I've seen this KSI calling him out and that, but I wouldn't say he's um, he's better than Jake Paul. Or they fought... Did them two fight? No, uh, he's fought KSI, has fought Logan Paul, but not Jake Paul. Yeah, he's fought his brother, hasn't he? Um, and I think he got beat. Did, did his brother beat him or did he beat his brother? It was brother? a draw, wasn't it? A draw, yeah, and I, I just, I just don't know if he's right. as good as Jake, you know. So, would you turn that down for really good money for like whatever he gets paid, say three million or something? Would you turn down fighting KSI for that? You know, I don't think I think I might come out of retirement and fight him. You know? <laughs> it makes it's better than two grand. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, Jake Paul said in the in the post fight he'd like to exercise the rematch clause. Um, Tommy said he'd be happy to do that. Obviously, <laughs> he's just won the fight and he wants that money again. Who can blame him? Yeah. If they do rematch next up, what's going to be different from the first fight? And do you anticipate you still being in the corner? Um, I think in the first fight you'll see a more improved Tommy. We didn't see what what he's capable of. We've seen some of it. His jab were really good. His feet were good at times. Um, he, he made he made him fall short quite a lot of times. Uh, there was plenty of openings as well for, for more counter punches. Uh, I think you'll see a tighter defence. I think you'll see him a bit more energy, a bit more rhythm. I think the occasion was stupid. It would have melted most men. Uh, I don't know... I look at it sometimes and I, I was feeling sorry for him, you know, with the occasion, with the mind games that Jake Paul plays, knowing that he was a B-side fighter. You know, there was a lot up against him. A lot of people didn't want him to win. He just had a newborn baby and then the contract got made for six weeks after. So they was hoping that that would have took something out of him as well. He had a lot of stuff going on, you know, and, it, it, it's, and to be fair, he hasn't made one excuse Um on him, on himself, Tommy, and he to be fair, he busted his hand early in early in the camp, you know, and he he hasn't mentioned it once, and maybe I shouldn't be mentioning it, but I just think it just shows what kind of person he is. I think straight after the the fight, Jake were like, "I've had a bad arm, I've been ill, I've done yeah. this," you know, and he come out with all these excuses, but you know, there the was part of the camp where Tommy was using one hand, you know, we we stopped him using, we, we just had him using one hand. So he didn't even make an excuse. So he had a his camp wasn't perfect, but he still he, he you know he's still he, I I feel like he's done amazing, but I still feel that there's so much to, more to come of him. You know, Tommy's quite a good athlete. He's quite athletic. He picks things up fast. He's heavy-handed, but I, I think it's going to take a little while, little little bit more to get it out of him. But it, we saw it. You know, inactivity kills fighters. And by having that fight, I'm sure he's learned a lot from it. I'm sure he's learned loads from that fight. So he'll bring that to the table next time. One thing about Jake is he's very he's in the gym regularly. Now Tommy's got a gym, he can be in regularly. And Jake's in the gym regularly, he's fighting regularly. You know, and hopefully um, Tommy can, you know, build on this and, and be out regularly and be in the gym learning because he does enjoy boxing. He does really enjoy it and he understands he's a novice. And will you be there with Tommy on this journey? I'm sure I will be. I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to stitch myself up. But yeah, um, I, I think everything went well. John enjoys the team. Me, John, and Bob Howard work well together. Um, we all know our places, and uh, I think Tommy likes us in the team. You know, so I, I can't see there being a problem. Yeah. And just before I let you go, your mentor, of course, was the late great Oliver Harrison. Yeah. What do you think he'd make of all this? The the YouTuber side, them making huge amounts of money, and and you being involved in it. Um, tough question, tough question. But I think I think Oliver had had go with a. He, he was quite um, an easygoing guy. Oliver. Mm. It took him quite a lot to get him fired up about stuff, <laughs> and uh, I think he always he was always big on the fighters making some money. 
you know, a retiring with something. And uh, I think if he sees that this is a good opportunity for the fighters to make some money, he'd probably go with it. But, um, yeah, because he, he's quite easy going. He'd just go with the flow, Oliver. Um, but he was obviously a, you know, proper boxing, old school boxing man. But yeah, I, th I think he'd probably, you know, just go. I think he'd probably laugh about some of the stuff that some of the antics that Jay Paul does. He'd probably just find it funny. So yeah, good stuff, mate. I really appreciate your time. Um, I know you're super busy in the gym as well, so I'll let you get it's back. But yeah, let's do this again soon. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks very much, Dan. Thank you. Bye, mate. <laughs>